The first speaker will be Eugene Chia, and he will be speaking about GPU.js. Eugene Chia is a developer turned serial entrepreneur who likes to build big things in big programming projects. He is now the CTO at his latest startup, UILicious, which allows development teams and QA testers to automate web application testing through a single cloud platform. In the past, he could also be randomly spotted at annual hackers throughout 2015 to 2016. Let's welcome him. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to to this. Uh, it's my first uh, it's my first in person talk in like since forever. So I just so so I, so when I just tweeted it out earlier, I got a few other like like the usual talk uh usual usual folks who give talks asking how's it going, how's the rules <laughs> and things like that. So I guess I will have to reply to them like how is it going. Uh, but yeah, actually there is a lot of speakers for a lot of dev events that are actually looking forward to for things resuming once again. So yeah, I'm actually really excited about this. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm Eugene. Um, uh, th this is about the GPU.js story. Um, pardon me if the uh, pardon me that these slides are actually designed more for like promoting the upcoming hack and roll. And yeah, and I I just realized you guys just finished your hack and roll, so so the design was a bit off there, but it's okay. Um, uh, this is GPU.js is actually about a project on how my friend Fasi and I we tried to troll the world. Uh, we we decided to make uh make fun of, about uh the joke or how everything will eventually run on JavaScript. So let's just do something that makes zero sense and let's just go with it. At, a, at that point in time, it really didn't make sense to, to do this. So, but then uh, somehow it turned out into a project that just apparently uh, uh, refused to die. Um, yeah. So uh, a, a warning up front, this is not on how to use GPO.js. It's more about like the story behind it and, and the technical crazy stuff that we do to get it to work. I mean, it's bigger. Uh, oh, the mouse doesn't work on this great computer, is it? Oh, okay, I see. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, since I was already introduced, uh, yeah, my name is Eugene. Uh, you can find me online under the tag name Pico Creator. Uh, yep, I don't need to introduce my startup anymore because since that was already done. Uh, uh, usually, uh, uh, the other co-creator for GPU.js is also your alumni, uh, Fazli Safan. He is a software engineer at C or one of the C-rated companies. He keeps changing among them so frequently I lost track. Uh, he's, he's also going under Fazli360. Uh, I do believe he's giving another talk soon. Uh, so a uh, shout out and please attend his talk that is upcoming. Uh, I don't know what's the date, but you can speak to the organizers. Okay, so the part one, the original hackathon story. Okay, so, so the story behind GPU.js was that uh, uh, we wanted to make GPU accelerated JavaScript as a joke. And the four of us came together. Um, and what happened was that we made it in 2016. Uh, the story spoiler is that we came in second. And it, and it was just a very weird journey since then. Because the, the thing about us four as a team, right? Uh, we, every year we had the history of like just not doing the projects properly. Uh, the first NUS I cursed, I pretty much spent all my time playing Nintendo Wii and then submitted a static site at the end of generator at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, uh, and, and that's basically how the, everyone in the team just ran. We just had fun all the time playing. We, we spent more time disturbing other teams than, than working on our project. So approaching our basically final year, we were like, okay, let's do this seriously. Let's actually try to win this. And, and we actually threw the idea out like, let's do something so ridiculous that people just go wow at it and don't care whether it makes practical sense or not. Just, let's just go for it. And yeah, so the idea was API similar to jQuery, make it as simple as possible and make it work. Yeah, that didn't work well because our like I mentioned, uh, we just started like, deferring like our plans on how do we do this? Let's prepare for this. Like one week after another with Super Mario, then I think it was Mario Kart 8. And then it was Hi Hi Royals. Yeah, we just basically kept playing the, the Wii U at that time. So things didn't go exactly as planned. Uh, um, our um, detailed winning master plan for the for the for the hackathon was basically somehow we input a function JavaScript through Voodoo Magic. At this time, Voodoo Magic was not defined. We output a web uh, WebGL code, uh, so GPU code effectively, 
And somehow everything works. This, this was literally as detailed as the plan was. And, and subsequently after that, it was, we, it was then when during the hack and roll started, we actually just kicked off. Um, Charles, before the event fast, actually we had to remind me that it, the event was the next day because I completely forgot about it. And, and we even started late because we were too busy eating the food and the swag at that time. So a few, it was only until a few hours later that we actually got our first boilerplate inside. That's basically our NPM imports. And subsequently, yeah, we started doing like basic stuff like Hello World. And this is the part where we realized as, as they advised our repeat at every time of this talk, do not do a compiler in a hackathon. You will regret it. Because literally at some point in, throughout the whole process, the sanity went out the window because we haven't even got Hello World to work. Because the idea was to somehow take one programming language, stuff it in, uh, get an abstract syntax tree system to work, to analyze the code, and then rebuild it in another language, which it didn't work reliably. And sometimes we were, at some parts, we were cheating with regex. So yeah, even, even a line as simple as function return 42 was not returning 42. And there was also another funny story regarding that. So as I say, like never do a compiler during a hackathon. Um, okay. Is slow? Yeah, so like it was only until like 4 a.m., right? That we got a single return line to work. And I don't know how many of you will be still awake at the time during the hackathon itself. And it was only until 7 a.m. that we got one plus one to work effectively. And we actually cheered on that. And from there on, it was just about optimizing and drinking more coffee, like none of us slept. And when we finally got like to be right before the end of the hackathon, right? We only finally got the proof that this project can work on a specific formula. The outcome of it, given that very specific formula, we got our 1000% speed up. Like in this very math hard matrix uh, formula calculation that is highly parallelizable, the strength of GPU versus CPU. Uh, and, and frankly, your mileage may vary because like we chose this function because we know that it's the best function to optimize on parallel parallelized computing. It's like, it's seriously the only one that will run this fast and your code will never be this fast. So yeah, but then we open source it. So we had our fun, we got in second, and yeah, we, that, that was the part behind us. And then we, we left it on the internet. 2017, the AI boom happened. Yeah, reminder, 2016 was pre-AI and pre-crypto and pre a lot of things. So the whole idea of using the GPU to do crazy stuff wasn't really a common thing yet. <laughs> so what happened? Yeah, first came the hacker news and the Reddit, then came the Twitter flood that came behind it. And the joke as of now is that this is now a yearly affair. Um, um, my, the tweet that I particularly love the best was this one. The first user thought was to use this for distributed password cracking of Bitcoin mining, uh, of which I think some people have tried. It didn't work out that well, but they still try. Uh, it was, but that was the first big break. But what really cemented the project, uh, like we, we weren't really like super active on it. It would be like, oh yeah, uh, can you fix this? Can you fix that? That's, Sure. But then came, came, came along uh, Robert Plummer, uh, which, which was working on brain.js, uh, brain which, yeah, training AI neural networks. They were, happening, they were happening to have this project that was doing neural network training in JavaScript. Guess what? He can plug in that JavaScript. If you remember your AI and neural networks, they tend to be very highly parallelizable tasks. He plugged it into GPU.js. And yeah, from then onwards, it just basically exploded. Because uh, uh, from then on, was like we were going back and forth and he eventually, he eventually became our main maintainer of this project. Uh, and and we, we've, with that integration, because Brain.js itself exploded with it uh, together, it, it became like my most popular open source project ever that eclipsed all other projects combined based on whatever metric you pick, stars, fox, et cetera. It doesn't make sense. And, and why is it being used today? Uh, as mentioned, Brain.js. AI machine learning application, but it wasn't just that. Like, uh, it was, I think at the time also there was an image and video processing. So image recognition was also a, was popular at that point in time. Uh, geospatial rendering and computing. This was the, this is actually the only known major commercial implementation that I know of GPU or JS, where they use it to, to do complex computation on geospatial data uh, and, and things, that, things that couldn't be done easily, but inside the browser. Um, other application, I think there's a paper about bot detection on it. 
Uh, and more recently, actually, um, is original main use case, drawing things on the canvas or generative artworks. And, and uh, even though I'm not fully supportive of this segment of the industry, it has reached a new milestone. GP.js have generated an NFT and artist has used it to make an NFT and has sold it. So I'm like, wow, good for you. <laughs> Uh, in other things, it was used for, it's actually now used in quite a fair bit of educational courses. Um, anyone here did the parallel computing module? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I did not put that in the module, okay? Ask your professor. It was not me. Or... <laughs> and yeah, if there was any errors and bugs you encountered, right? Uh, if it makes you feel better, you can think that it was my code that failed and definitely not fast code or nor Robert's code, nor your code. You definitely did nothing wrong there. But yeah, so this is what I mean by it refused to die. It is now being used in a lot of uh, parallel computing examples because it's very convenient. It's in the browser. Anyone can hack on it. You don't need a supercomputer. Uh, yeah. So how does this voodoo happen? The underneath the hood stuff. Uh, disclaimer a bit, the examples in here are pretty dated. Uh, so, but, the, but the underlying architecture is the same. So yeah. So. I, uh, for those who do not know how, how this actually, how the project actually works, right? At least for the end user, it's pretty much straightforward at the beginning. Uh, you include it like, like any other JavaScript project. Uh, you configure your, you configure their dimensions. Like, so these are basically how much, uh, how big the arrays you want to be manipulating on. There's a lot of other parameters you can configure, but that's not the point here. Uh, you subsequently create your function inside a kernel. And, and then subsequently when you execute on it, when you execute on it, you, you get a result. It will somehow magically pass it, transfer it to the GPU and give you your end result. Uh, and and you, can, you can do different kinds of operations on it. You can even do, let's say, canvas processing on it, which, but, but once again, like I say, this is not a how to, or, or the step aside of how to do this. I just want to focus on the generalization on how did we get this to work. So underneath the hood, right? What we actually do is uh, we actually tran uh, transpile your, your JavaScript code into WebGL code. So what does WebGL does? Basically on the canvas, right? It draw, it draw triangles uh, and it does, and for like your logical and maths oper operation, well, OpenGL is implemented WebGL, right? It does not support a lot of your math operation. Basic math operations are not even in place in uh, that, that you may think so. Uh, beyond, uh, and like, like Pest key things that are not important in programming, like loops, doesn't exist uh, for, for random size. Uh, it only supports like integer 64 and float 32. And, and you can't run in web workers. Like basically there's a lot of things that is annoying about it that doesn't make it one-to-one -one compatible with JavaScript. So what do we do? Back to this uh, compiling to GLSL. We take this function in, we read the ASD. So if any of you did uh, the compiler course before, you may be familiar with this so you can see the function kernel, I trust, I, I, I ran it through the SD and you get this giant tree the, the, where, where basically if you see the top is the function and subsequently it defines the parameters and the block statements. Yeah, it's basically your code being read but in an object way that, that subsequently your program can look through it and start to analyze it. Then subsequently for each operation that you do, we figure out what's the most optimal way to do this in, in WebGL. If the math operation does not exist, we re-implement the entire math operation for you. Um, yeah, so that's the first step in the, the madness that begins. And if you remember, the, like, if your original code is around 62 characters here, like this is just a sample. Uh, your compiled code in WebGL could be over 4,200 characters. So yeah, a lot of code generation happened. And, um, other things like I mentioned, like WebGL does not allow you to do branching statements well. So you can't do your if else. You know what we do? We compute both formulas and then we evaluate which one to return back to you. So for every if else you have, right, we basically split it and compute all poss possibilities. <laughs> so yeah, but there was this one very pesky thing. Uh, there is no input values in, uh, or at least variables in WebGL. So when you transfer your data over, it's not like you can read an array. It's not like you get an array inside. So this is, this is the next step in the madness that we had to do. And believe me, you did not, I did not want to find out this part of the madness at 2 a.m., but we had to do it. So if let's say you take your input, let's just take, take this very simple array, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, ten. What we end up doing is we actually inputted a texture, a, a texture, uh, so, if that's, if, so it can be 10 pixels or some optimal size uh, there. 
And for each color representation, we basically treat it as the data storage where you can read and uh, where we can write the data in from the JavaScript side and it can be read from the shader side. So, and because your, binary, uh, your bit length and binary length does not match up. So we basically have to convert from whatever data set we put in into the binary representation that we write into the, the texture and then read it back out. So in this case, yeah, uh, several RGBA. Uh, there was also like, I think a few notes of regarding like, because textures are, has a certain accuracy yeah. limit. Yeah, we basically have to take that into account as well. Yeah, so we input up into textures and then, and then we do the same thing in, in reverse. So when you actually write an output, you cannot write your, your, your numbers into the system. Because at the end of the day, this was meant to be a GPU-based system. It's meant to draw a texture. It's meant to draw an image. And that's what we do. You, we write it into a canvas, into a canvas image. And then we and then we convert it into 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 this rep, uh, numerical representation. Uh, this is basically an oversimplification. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Zoom. Uh, yeah, I didn't know I couldn't be heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah. And this is kind of an oversimplification, but then yeah. So that's how what we need to do for the textures, and then we had to. Now, we, now that we know the coordinates of like where, where the texture is and where the, the numbers to read and write, now we had to link it to what we previously generated in the code. So that had, so yeah. But then this is where things, are, things gets weirder and weirder. Uh, well, the idea makes sense at a high level, right? Uh, so, so for example, like, oh, just draw a rectangle on the screen, on the size of the screen. Like you have to remember like, in, in GPU land, there's no such thing as a rectangle, so you have to do two triangles, small things like that. So what happens when we run the program? As I mentioned, because we had to input and output the data, the, the texture, yeah, you just get a giant noise because that is all your, your, binary, uh, your, all your data in, like, in some weird representation. So the magic in, in three simple sentences, right, is that your arrays or your data becomes texture, your kernel, your functions become shader code, and your result is basically your screen output. So like we, you can take this and actually there is a command that you can actually output whatever you render onto the screen. And some people do that. Actually, that's one main use case to draw stuff on the screen. Or you could use it as, as a way to store your binary data and then ship it back to the, uh, to the JavaScript land. So yeah, and caveats. And yeah, um, so that, that, at this point, this is basically what we done in the hackathon for most JavaScript commands and math operations. And we got that, 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 that super efficient, perfect world example working. Subsequently, uh, oh, actually I realized I may be off by one side sometimes. Okay, subsequently, right, this is when we, when we went, when we released it out into the wild, that is where things get super weird. Like take this for example, right? Take this variable. So you got uh, X equals to one, right? And then you got your if else operation, and then you got your division and multiplication, right? Yeah. Um. I'm, as I mentioned, branch diversion is not something that you can do very well on WebGL, and it costs things to slow down. So we compute it both. Uh. The other thing is like uh. Apparently, the floating spec the floating specification on a GPU, right, is not very well defined. Um. Yeah. They they had a, they, there's a certain guideline on the accuracy, right? Turns out, right, lots of vendors don't, don't, don't follow it. Uh, some, vendor, uh, some browsers even make it worse. So we have, the spe we have the specification, like in some cases say, oh, you need to be up to three or six digits accuracy. No, they don't, it gets worse. Uh, so, so yeah, like something like this, like divide by three times three may not give you a consistent result, things like that. Um, yeah, we had to write work around code. So now we had to pad our code even more to handle like this kind of inaccuracy by, by doubling the amount of uh, data that we store for the digits to improve the precision. To make things worse, that return 42 is not a joke. We actually put it in a lot of places because you look at this if else, nowhere is it possible to return that last line. But apparently some graphics driver like the Intel HD 2000 will return 42 on this function in WebGL land. We don't know why it just happens. So, so, so within, within our WebGL code, right, you find like some weird return statements that, hey, logically this will never reach. No, it's okay. If we detect that it is rich in return, 
we know that your graphic driver sucks and we will just switch you over to CPU mode. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, just basically things goes on and on. Like, like apparently the GPU is responsible, you know, for your OS display and stuff. Yeah, so apparently like things will, like if you do too much things, it will kill the shader program if it takes too long. So you may, your browser may randomly crash. And yeah, and I think, and, and, and at least I think I wrote, I wrote this slide in 2017, like, or 2018. Like fast forward to 2019, 2020, I, I even received reports of a user complaining, right? The computer completely freeze and died and was never able to restore. So yeah, the, the, the best part was that I didn't even respond to that statement, but apparently like, I think some, some other random reader responded to me, uh, responded for me to what I would have said anyway. It was like, no way should a browser code, any code load in the browser kill your computer. Something is very wrong there. And I agree. I don't know what, what he was doing with it, but yeah, I am terrified that somehow I can kill a computer. Yeah, so, so, more, so more onto that. So yeah, uh, if anyone did the parallel computing, this is, this, is, this, is, this is basically just a rehash, right? So, so one thing, what makes GPU better than a CPU? Um, in general, if you can think about it in, in simpler terms, right? A CPU is very simple for like, let's say one, can all CPUs have eight concurrency, eight, eight CPU or 16 cores and so on. But let's just simplify it. You only have one core. Uh, you can only work on one task at a time. Where on GPU, typically you're talking about 500 cores, uh, 500 cores or even a thousand cores. Like I'm using an analogy here. We don't call them cores, we call them threads. But for simplicity, you can think of it in those terms. So they can work on 500 math operations at a time. They are less efficient, they're slower. Okay, not that much lower, but they're less efficient and they're more limited. They cannot do everything a CPU can. But because there's so much more of it and they have so much access to data, they have a huge memory space. Like you have heard of GPUs with eight gigs of RAM or 12 gigs of RAM. They can process huge amount of data. And that's basically what, what carried the entire AI machine learning more. So, so an example of this, right? A very simple example of this, right? It will be your, your computation stuff. Huh? especially your, your for loops, nested in the for loops. So take this uh, matrix example. You have three for loops and then you just do a simple summation across all of it. Um, um, not too complicated. What we, what, how you would convert this right into GPU.js code, right? Is you simply extract out your, your, your final for loop and then you create a kernel on it. And then the rest, the rest you just indicate as a dim the dimensions of your input. You send in your input data and then you, you do the computation on it accordingly. So this is a 512 by 512 matrix. And at that point of, oh shit. It, yeah, I just realized I did that in 2017 and graphics card has not aged. Yeah, apparently. So, so, so like uh, GTX 1080 versus an i7 and apparently a 1080 is still a good graphic card now. Uh, it was 18 times faster. And, and, and yeah, I think that just speaks for itself in this very isolated use case. However, this is assuming you did not do any like major if and else all over the place, like if we saw in the example. And once you start doing if and else, like I said, the GPU doesn't know what to do with that. So it has to compute both paths. Things start to break apart. So, so, uh, so and to put in hindsight, like how, how this, uh, this performance is not only just faster. If you look into the, to the power consumption of let's say a GPU or a, a CPU, at the performance improvement, uh, the performance improvement they give right just basically makes it much more energy efficient. So this is why you you crypto mine on a GPU and not a CPU. And it, and but then I think the world has moved on to ASIC mining. Yeah. So more examples. I think I think this is the phone example, uh, which is even more ridiculous apparently because your your ARM cores are like terrible, but the the GPU on it is great. Uh, the results is a bit updated because this is for iPhone 7. I don't think anyone here has an iPhone 7. So yeah, summary. Uh, we made a hack. Uh, we were doing things that it was not designed to, and it was extremely painful. But the end result is that anyone can now use this to do GPU programming if they just know basic JavaScript. Uh, another thing that I will also say, right, because this is like many years down the road, right? Like I said, when we created this, right, it wasn't the AI boom. It wasn't even the GPU boom. It wasn't even the crypto boom or whatsoever. But we just did it for fun. So in a way that, uh, in a way that the, the, this is my promotional tagline for the next hackathon, right? Work on something fun. Do something crazy. 
it, it, it doesn't even make sense. It, it doesn't even need to advance your career in any way or whatsoever. It doesn't even need to support the current trend because you may never know. Maybe the next trend just uses what you, what you built and you dump it on the internet and somehow it went crazy on its own. Interested to find out more, you can read up on QDAS, uh, QDAS and GPU programming. Um, if you want to find the project itself, it's gpu.rocks. Um, uh, for, for more follow-up notes that apparently I'm not obliged to say because this is NUS. Uh, please, if, if you're writing a research paper while using gpu.js, please cite the paper general purpose computing on GPUs in the browsers using gpu.js. Uh, I really hated that, that title. <laughs> Otherwise, feel free to hack on it if you are working on your FIP and maybe do a full pool request. If you're familiar with shader programming and AST, uh, Robert, um, current maintainer, will always be looking for additional helping hands on the project. Yeah, and yeah, join the next hack and roll. I can't figure out what year to put there. So yeah, fast, fast like these extra notes. Like somehow we are the, we are the top ranking word for, for JavaScript and GPU, and we did nothing. And, and other things like why we use Jellyfish is because as we mentioned, multiple threads. Yeah, yeah. I think I already mentioned. Yeah, like seriously, I should not be able to burn your computer from the browser. Okay, that's about it. Ooh. Oh, I realized I have now half an hour instead of fifteen minutes. I went through a bit too fast. Thing. Thank you, Eugene. So does anyone have any questions for him? Um. So, you know, if you could design a piece of, if you could design your own GPU or you know, redesign OpenGL or something, What's one feature that you would like to have access to? Uh, the oh. um, just the number one. Obviously, <laughs> there's many. Like maybe you'd like for loops oh, or uh, if else. So I, this is the part where I really wish fast is here because he was so explode at that question. Uh, wait, okay, I ask you this. Uh, wait, are you referring to WebGL or are you referring to uh, uh, GPUs in general? Anywhere along the stack where it would help you. Okay, so uh, in particular, we will, uh, we will get really particularly annoyed if we are talking about, uh, not at you to be clear, <laughs> when you're talking about WebGL, because when we, when we created this project, right? So basically all the browser vendors, right? Uh, all the browsers have decided to, so right now we're using WebGL and if you see, right? It's using a super ancient specification. Where, where was the freaking slide on it? Uh, yeah, we are using, OpenGL ES 1.0. Uh, I'm not asking for much because the, the OpenGL uh, ES, like the future versions are already out. It already exists on the internet, okay? Uh, the specifications out, it has already been implemented directly in the GPU before. What happened is that, because the, for WebGL, the WebGL, uh, effectively Chrome and the rest, they were like, oh, we are going to implement a new uh, web, uh, I can't remember what's the term, uh, GL shader, uh, no, GL shader library that will replace WebGL. Therefore, we will not be doing any, any changes on this. That was 2016, it's not yet out. <laughs> so if you're asking like, if there was one thing I wanted, yeah, you guys could have upgraded this and added more to this instead of like trying to recreate the whole thing and on a mythical spec that I have not heard and seen yet. So yeah, that would be the one thing that I wish for WebGL. As for the GPU itself, right? Uh, this is actually a very tricky, tricky step, really, because like, like, I can feel that GPUs are already <clears throat> quite well thoroughly optimized for its niche case. I mean, the, a lot of things that I ran here, like, like what I wish could be done better, is also in part because of the limitations here. Um, like once you start going into CUDA programming itself, right? Actually, a lot of these limitations are actually hand waved away for you. Like even like for example, like I mentioned, like like your standard if else stuff, right? If it's not able to done efficiently, right? Uh, even like the QDA libraries will actually automatically handle this for you as well, and they do it do it fairly well. And you can replace QDA with with Metal with that's Apple's version and basically a few other stuff, and uh and and pretty much 
it's actually very well tailored for that use case. Uh, high, high memory input, high parallelized computing. Um, if there's one thing that I will fundamentally change, right, uh, uh, is, that, is that actually to open up the, GP, the way GPU works, right, uh, to be more similar to actually what you have in the Xbox or the consoles. So, so right now, right, if you see, right, uh, if you see our performance chart, right, if I ever open, oh, can I open the browser? Yeah, oh, awkward. I can't, oh, it's to the right, okay. Okay. Rocks. Yeah, I type in, I, uh, uh, oh, okay. yeah. Not my computer, so I I don't know. <laughs> ah yes, thank you. Uh, disclaimer: I'm using the school's computer, so it's not mine. <laughs> so yeah, like I had so like for example, right? If you see like at anything below a certain size, right? We actually spend an an incredible amount of compute, right, to actually transfer the data from from the CPU from your your from your RAM. To the GPU and to compute it. Uh, in in the console world, right, the memory the memory channel is unified together, so the GPU can directly access the CPU memory. But on the flip side, security be damn lah. Probably that's that's the principle behind it. Lah. So the the GPU can access uh the CPU memory that uh the memory very efficiently, and there's no need for this cross transfer. So if there if if I were to re-architecture the way GPU and CPU works, right. Is to actually fundamentally support this behavior within the PCIe Express lane, uh, where the GPU can can do it do so. Um, this idea has already sort of taken off. If you look into the like the new implementation of Windows 11 driver, uh, they are actually trying to get the GPU to be able to directly access the the NVMe storage uh, to in order to read from it, uh, bypassing the CPU and and I guess improve your your load times, but. Uh, it's still not going as far as directly reading and writing into CPU memory. The, uh, yeah, and I understand the limitations uh, because at the end of the day, it's a trade-off between like being able to make your memory swappable on your motherboard. And like if you open up your Xbox and see the memory chips, it's fully soldered on, it's fully integrated. So yeah, never, so it's like, it's that trade-off that is very difficult. Like as me, a, a, as a hacker, right, I want everything to be, I can unplug and plug in and then try and fix it. And then if it's spoiled, just replace it. Uh, as a right to repair and to use, I like it to be repairable. But, but on the flip side, right, if I want it to be everything be so integrated, right, I may need to do what Apple did, which is to put everything to one giant chip. Mm -hmm. Ugh, sexy for performance, but the part of like when something spoils and you need to replace everything, ah, man, that hurts. Wait, so does resizable bar address any of what you said? A uh, resizable bar does actually improve. So resizable bar, specifically AMD, right, uh, improves the, the amount of data you can move in and out in a single sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 like if, if you look if you look especially at the lower at the lower spectrum of the clock cycle, right. So one thing disadvantage of the GPU, and this part definitely I'll be glad if it can be improved, lah, But I they do do it for higher end GPUs or like I mean those like uh commercial GPUs is that is that the GPU needs to run in a certain block. So like, if let's say like, tr like let's say thread 30 to 60, right? It's already done, right? It cannot work on the next task, in, uh, uh, next program per se, in, because since all the other threads are working on the same program at the same time. Um, and so because of that, right? There's, there, there's a certain like batch push and uh, like when we transfer from CPU to GPU, there's a certain batching that we do, batch by batch. Uh, so what resizable da bar does, right? It means that it makes it easier and better for us to push more data in one batch. So we can make it more efficient. But like I say, my, my, my ideal world, which, which is what Apple kind of did, is I don't even need to use that. I just, I don't need to copy the data from CPU to GPU. It's just read directly from the, from the CPU side. But yeah, that's the ideal world. Huh? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um. Yeah, hi. Um. Thank you so much for the talk. Um. I was wondering. Um. 
what was your preparation like um, for making this library? Because I'm guessing you knew a bit about GPU, I mean, a lot about GPUs um, before the hackathon. So like, where do you read up? What was the process like? Were you even sure whether you make it or not? <laughs> how do you know WebGL? Where did all this like, how do you know the specification for WebGL 1.0? Like, where do you read up on it? Like, did you get classes somewhere or what? Yeah, I'm just curious to know your, prep, your process, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I preluded the prep, the, the real preparation was zero, but that, that's probably oversimplifying it because a lot of a lot of what made this project actually possible was things falling in place coincidentally. I would phrase it that way. So like, for example, right, the only reason why we, the only reason why, let's say, let's say we could work on, on shader programming like WebGL was because I did, I, I went to make video games for fun and as a, as a part-time work, work before. So I, I, I made my own game engine at some point and I did some shader programming. Yeah. Um, so was it related to this project? No, but I, that's how I learned it. Uh, Matt, uh, Matthew, who is, who is another member of the team, he, he, I think he did the compiler course uh, at the NUS site. So he was the one that went to learn how to do, do the, who knew how to do the ASD processing and handling through the course. Uh, yeah, uh, the spoiler alert uh, in, the mid, in the middle of it, we took our first ASD and found it that it wasn't usable and then we threw it out the window. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> because the, yeah, so in hindsight, we could have played a bit more with the library to practice, but yeah, we, we didn't. We just like, oh, the, the industry used this. This should work. That was basically how we went in. Um, so yeah, he did the ASD heavy lifting uh, at that point. Uh, that, that all the ASD we use during Akaton has already been thoroughly replaced because now there's TypeScript and all the other stuff. But but then but yeah, so that was the skill set he had in place. And then uh, then fast actually is the one that actually had had uh, overlapping skill sets in all this. So like well, my my side was more towards like the 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 JavaScript programming. I I know I'm also quite familiar with JavaScript V8 internals. Uh, but that's more of like an adjacent thing. He was the one that knew JavaScript and he was the one that knew new ASD and also a little bit of GPU. And he was the basic the brain child behind this. And it's like, let's put this together. He's the one who made the team together. Yeah, that was how it was supposed to be on paper. We were supposed to prepare. We were supposed to check all this. It didn't happen. <laughs> but I can't say, I can't say as if as if like, oh, we just played and then somehow we went in. It's actually all these very coincidental experiments that we did in our school or even our work before school or whatsoever, since I was part-timing, that somehow became relevant. And yeah, so if I were to say, how do you prepare for this kind of crazy stuff? Uh, just try random things. Huh? Um, like, like, because you're a student right now, and I actually, and, and to be honest, right, this is something that I struggle with more and more, as now I'm doing, I'm, I'm now married, I am now doing professional and all that. Like, like sometimes you can be like, let's say like be a US hackers or like a Friday fan or whatsoever. Oh, why is it the one thing about the computer that you were, you were interested in, but it's the furthest from what you know? You can just whack it. And then who knows, maybe it'll come relevant later. Thanks. Um, follow up on that. Did you have any other ideas when you went in? Like were you, were you sure about making a GPU JS transpiler? Like what if you made like a cat video or something and who knows? Oh, um, to be honest, uh, if it failed, we would just probably just play more, more, more than Nintendo Switch. <laughs> that was at that time. Uh, we had other crazy ideas like, subsequently after this. So like, um, uh, well, uh, there's, there's another hackathon that, that we took part, uh, what was it? Uh, silly hackathon. Uh, so that's another hackathon that I would, would suggest if you all ever can, if it ever restarts. Um, what Fast and I did uh, subsequently down there, we made a JavaScript uh, dependency deppifier. So what it did was that it scans your entire code base. For every statement, it creates a JavaScript package. So, so, so if you thought about the JavaScript, like your NPM uh, dependency hell, let's make the hell even worse. It, there's also a command for it to, to actually upload all, all of it into your, your namespace so, so that you can have as many packages as you want. Uh, yeah, you can you can search it on the CD Deppifier. There's a demo video. I kind of choose not to really like update the the the, the project. The the code is there. I didn't write how to use it because I'm kind of terrified of it being used actually. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that was like one other random idea that we executed in another hackathon. But other than that, yeah, it's all it's just the ideas are all, the ideas are always based on how ridiculous can you push one thing. Just take one meme one idea so in this case running javascript 
everything in JavaScript, push it to the maximum. Uh, the depifier joke was uh, NPM modules, we complain about it having way too much packages. Let's just make it worse. Because uh, since, since one line packages are so popular, let's just do that. Yeah, so things like that. Um, was it a right idea? I have no idea. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Is there any questions on Zoom? There's only one. Any questions? Yeah. Actually, if anyone on Zoom asks questions, how? Oh, but can we even hear them? Or oh, someone's been sending emails, it? Oh, can someone talk? Because I have no idea whether the speakers actually work. Hello, hello. I'm from Zoom. Okay. So anyone has any questions? So thank you, Eugene, for the very insightful talk. I'm sure most of us will, will be very inspired to do some cool project next year for Hack and Roll. So thank you once again. Oh, you don't need to do anything too crazy. Just do whatever pushes you. <laughs> Just the same. <laughs> also, the first Hack and Roll team um, will be presenting. So they are called the Lean Conglomerate and Keith. So do, do give them your fullest support. All right. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, good evening uh, to all of you uh, on-site and off-site. So uh, today, uh, I mean, I'm Dominic and I have with me uh, Angie and Keith. And today we'll be talking to you about our hack and roll uh, project, The Pet. So yeah, as, as mentioned by Yong Kang, our name is the Lim Conglomerate and Keith. Yeah, okay, let's get started. Right, so uh, this is actually a preview of the that we actually show you uh, what he actually does. Yeah, so Keith, please. I'm sorry, he stole my mouse. Give me a sec. <laughs> is the audio on? Uh, sorry, are you guys sharing audio? Because I don't think we can hear you. Oh, okay. Hold on. Huh? Sorry, is there audio now? Still can hear. Still can hear. <laughs> Weird. Okay, y'all can see the screen, but not the audio, right? Yeah. Hmm. We try to share the window. Okay. Uh, how about now? No, I still can't hear. Okay. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, so sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Oh no, too many memes. <laughs> Get out of the way. Oh, okay. I think it's fine without the audio. It's mostly just background music. There's no description for the for the video. <laughs> it's just background music. Oh, oh. Right. Okay. So sorry about that, everyone. Um it's okay, but we will we will talk more about like what the pet does uh, later. Right, so uh, moving on. Next slide, please. So these are the table of uh, this is the table of contents. So 
Oops. We have the motivation firstly. So what actually sparked the idea of the pet? And actually, um, the pet is actually a combination of the peak cat. Yeah. And then secondly, we have the technology, what we actually use to build the pet. And lastly, we have the challenges, what uh what we actually face when we build uh the pet. Yeah. So yeah, for our motivation, um next slide, please. So uh, we were actually inspired by like a uh, desktop pet application such as Desktop Goose, I think, which is more popular, and then uh, eSheet. And then we were actually intrigued with how like uh, virtual pets actually interacts with the operating system and the environment. And lastly, it's our first time making a desktop pet in Python. Yeah. So now um, I'll pass on the time to Angie. Yeah, and she'll share with you more. Sorry, it's to keep actually. <laughs> Right, okay. So I'll be talking about the technical aspect of this project. So first off, we program uh, the pet using Python. More specifically, Python's uh, DK inter module, which is a way to render graphics onto our screen. Like this the pet here right now is using this module. So what how DK inter works is that we can create windows, resize and translate them all over the screen. So for example, we have this uh, notepad. We basically use a combination of uh, windows to make it look like a notepad. So how do we move windows around? Uh, first off, we use a Windows 32 GUI module. So using this module, we can like grab windows on our screen and uh, move them around. That's the basic functionality of a uh, Windows 32 GUI module. Lah. So but as for hijacking the mouse, you can see that the pet sometimes takes away my mouse and uh, chases after it. So this one is using another library called py input. So yeah, that's basically it. Okay, this pet is really annoying right now. I'm gonna close him. So how does the pet work specifically? Well, we use a state machine. So basically he's like a he swaps between different states randomly. So he starts off in the idle state and then he randomly like changes around to grab windows, create windows, or chase our mouse, all this kind of different stuff. So yeah. So I'm gonna pass on to Angie our challenges we face when doing this project. Oh, thanks, Keith. So here are some of the challenges we face throughout the project. Uh next slide. No, thank you. So firstly, we actually wanted to have multi-platform support. So the pet can be able to be run on both Mac and Linux and Windows also. But there are multiple issues. For example, TK Inter could not render properly on Linux. And we only found this out a little too late into the project. We just thought, oh, I'm sure it's just a minor function change. We can do it later, which was honestly a big mistake because that's not how it works. <laughs> we also found out some functions like how we were able to move our application windows are platform dependent just cause different OS have their own way of doing things. So to provide different platform support, probably need to find some other libraries to help us do so. And also all of us were not very experienced with Python. So we had to relearn the language on the spot. We kind of went into this project completely blind besides, hey, wouldn't it be cool to make a desktop pad? So, but it was honestly a really cool experience and we learned a lot from it. Uh, next slide. So, if you guys want to make your own desktop pad or modify some behavior, add more memes or just change the animation, you can easily do so. Uh, next slide, thank you. Our release build has some text files where you can just change the parameters that easily and it will be reflected on the application. So we'll link our repo if you guys want to have a reference to try making your own too, or if you want to download the project. Thank you. So is there any questions? Is it GPU accelerated? Uh, no, I don't think yeah, so. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with for agreeing to present on Friday hacks and hope that you all join again next year. See you. Thank you so much. Thank right, you. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, all right. Good evening, everybody. I uh, hope you are excited to see uh, what we have in store for you today. So today we would like to present to you our project, a uh, cat can code. Um, 
Now, before we begin sharing more about this project, I want to first share with you what our core inspiration behind this project was. Uh, next slide, please. So, since um, all four of us are studying in the line of computing, we always hear our friends like, you know, complaining about how difficult coding is. And I'm sure all of us here have felt that way before. I mean, at least I have. <laughs> so, this is where our project, you know, Cats Can Code came from. Um, we want to let everyone know, you know, coding really isn't that difficult. In fact, coding is for everyone. Because if a cat can code, you can as well. Okay, next slide. So now let me quickly give you a brief overview of how everything comes together. Uh, firstly, let's take a look at our main coders room. So also known as the cat's playroom. We have secretly placed, you know, multiple ultrasonic sensors around the room, from their litter box to their food bowls. And when any of these adorable cats, like, you know, walk past the sensor, a signal will be sent to our back end. Uh, next slide. So it's just all the processing and generate the code shown on our website. So now that you know you have an idea of what cats and code is all about, I want to show you all a short snippet of uh, these cats in action. Okay, next slide. Enjoy. I hope you enjoyed that little clip and the beautiful code that the cats have uh, written over there. Uh, in, uh, in case any of you are wondering, right, so I just the text tag that our group uh, used for this project. And now I'll actually be handing the time over to Adeline, who will give you a more in-depth look uh, into our project. Uh, next slide. Yep, so I'll be going over the hardware that we use for our project. So the main uh, microcontroller that we use for this project is the ESP32. So we wanted to use this because it has a built-in Wi-Fi module, which was essential to our project because we have to send the sensor readings to the back end. And the ultrasonic sensor that we use is the HCSR04, which can provide readings of the estimated distance between the sensor and the object in front of it. So that's what we use to sense whether the cats have triggered the sensors. So in our project, we actually connected, uh, we connected four ultrasonic sensors all to the ESP32. So the other tech, the other part of the hardware that we use is MQTT using Hive MQ. So usually for ESP32, um, it's usually used to only link devices that are connected to the same local network. But we actually couldn't use this for cat scan code because we want anyone in the world to be able to see the code being generated. So we used MQTT using this broker called HiveMQ, and we actually highly recommend it because their free plan can connect up to 10 devices to the same broker, although we only use two for this project. Uh, next slide. So how this works, where we integrate the hardware with the software is that Firstly, with the ESP32 connects to the MQTT broker, so that's one device. And then it publishes a message to the sensor topic when a sensor is triggered. Um, and this message contains the sensor ID. So the sensor ID is basically which sensor we label according to the cat location. So for example, the litter box would be sensor one, and then the football would be sensor two, and so on. So the Flask backend also connects to the same broker and it subscribes to the same sensor topic. So after that, it can receive messages freely. So now I'll be passing the time to Jovin to explain more about what the backend does when it receives the messages. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll go through how the backend works and how the code generation works because one thing that our project does is that it generates code based on the cat inputs. So firstly, as we mentioned just now, the backend subscribes to an MQTT topic, which is where it receives the cat inputs from. And then the main functionality of the backend is actually a get endpoint that will return a string, which is the code that we've generated so far. And we didn't use a database. So instead we maintain state and consistency using a kind of hacking method, which is pickling the entire code object and saving it to a file. 
and then we reload the file every time new inputs are received, and then we resave the file every time new code is generated. So the reason why we needed this like pseudo database is that there was quite a lot of work going on in the backend that required a consistent state to generate the code. So when we originally deployed to Heroku, then we found that there were a lot of issues with parallel instances causing multiple codes to be generated at the same time. Yeah, so, and we use Flask because Flask is in Python and our code generation was in Python since it's faster to like write algos quickly in Python. And it was also our first time working in Flask, but luckily it wasn't, it wasn't too painful to use, so it was okay. Yeah, okay, next slide. Then for the code generated, we decided to generate Python code because it has a very simple syntax and it's dynamically typed. So we don't need to specify the types when outputting the code and we don't need to use things like curly braces or a lot of brackets for if else blocks or loops. Although unfortunately using Python also means that indentation matters, so we had to take that into account. And we did that by maintaining an environment object that has things like the current indentation level, the variables defined so far, and that type, and the current state of the code or the unclosed nodes and so on. Okay, next slide. So now I'll go through exactly how we went about generating the code. And this graph is kind of a representation of the idea behind our code generation. So we basically, we have a directed graph and each node represents a stage at which a decision must be made. And when combined with the current environment object, a node will represent a possible state of the code that is generated. So each edge is kind of like a decision that is made. So you can see like the top leftmost node there, which is red, is labeled with numbers and the numbers represent the cat input. So it's kind of like the cat making a decision on what code to write next. So for example, when sensor tree is triggered, then the node will choose to go to a variable assignment. So the next line of code will be a variable assignment. And then basically the idea is that each sensor input is a decision made on which edge to traverse next. Yeah, so right now, let's say for example, we've traveled to the variable assignment node, then we go through more decisions on things like the variable name, what type the variable will be, uh, what value to assign it to. And then this kind of implementation allows for more recursive behavior without too much additional effort. So for example, we can generate an array of arrays. And then finally, we return to a closing node, which is which will close off the variable assignment. So it's kind of like a split node that you may have come across in 2040 or a CS 2040. So it, it was a bit hard to generate manually generate an entire graph of every possible state of the code. So we didn't do this. And instead, we used a combination of nodes, edges, a stack, and an environment object to keep track of state, which made the implementation a lot simpler. Yeah, so the stack keeps track of the current and closed nodes. So every time we want, we have an input, we just pop off the stack to find the node that we're on, and then we combine it with an environment object to figure out the exact state of the code. So now I'll pass the time on to Prach, who will cover the front end. Yeah. yeah so for the front end, it's actually created using uh, React.js. So it's a very simple web app that essentially displays like some basic information about our beautiful app and the live code. And essentially to retrieve the code, we uh, we actually implemented like a very basic polling function. Sorry, whoops. It, uh, implemented a very basic polling uh, code. So essentially every one second, it will send a simple get request and see if, the, if there's any changes to the code. And if there is, it will display the new code. So yeah, and with that, you can actually see that the code kind of updates in real time. and Taking into account like some minor hardware uh, latency, you I think the code will update within like a few seconds. And yep, that's about it. So thank you so much for listening. And we are very glad to present this to y'all. If y'all have any questions, feel free to ask. Any questions? So when you read from your ultrasonic sensor, right? Is it just a simple, there is a cat in front or there is no cat in front? Or do you actually take into account the distance the cat is from the sensor and then it generates different code based on distance? Hello. Um, actually, it's just um, cat or no cat. Like we have a distance threshold and we calibrated that according to cat behavior. And then we use that in our code to determine whether there's a cat in front. Thanks, Neil. Do you have a GitHub so I can 
put a PR in because I want that feature. Ah, uh, wait, let me try to find. I think in the meantime, there's another question from Eugene Awo, and he's asking if how, how do you ensure that the code is actually compilable? Because when people think of these kind of projects, they are kind of always stuck by like how to ensure this kind of like behavior, well-defined behavior due to like randomness. Okay, so um, basically the motivation behind our project was that we want to generate code that is compilable. I mean, okay, it's Python code, so it's not compilable. It's syntactically correct. So that's why we use a directed graph because we want to limit the possible states of the code. So by using a graph and then, de and then defining like from one node, the limited number of nodes that you can go to from that node, we ensure that the code is always compilable. So in a sense, like in a nutshell, we basically limit the number of possible states. I see. And personally, I have a question for you guys as well. Is that, uh, I kind of forgot my question. Uh, for this project, right, is there any like interesting code that your cat like generated? Like, do y'all come across anything that's particularly interesting? Um. <laughs> I wouldn't call it particularly interesting. There was this one incident, uh, one moment where like a cat was just eating its food, and then it just created like a nested if loop like all the way, and then it went <laughs> out of bounds. <laughs> so like, it, I won't say it's anything interesting, like It's like typical cat behavior, you know, cats being cats. I see that has that must have been very funny to actually like watch. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Are there any questions from the floor? If there's no questions, then uh thank you so much for your very insightful talk. I think um, since your talk is about whether cats can code, I, I'm sure a lot of beginner coders will also be inspired. <laughs> Alright, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alright, uh, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Alright, okay. Uh, so I'll get started real quick. Okay, so our project for hack and roll is Pinoculus, uh, otherwise known as .ispymb, if you get the joke. So we are Team Flexbox, and I'll, I'll be doing a presentation today. I'm Nikai. Okay, so before we get started, let's first talk about what is Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is like a Python GUI, like a G Python with extra features. It lets you run code in nice containers, and it prints the output nicely below the containers. So Jupyter Notebook's main use nowadays is for data analysis and also making very nice looking documents. So uh, how do you run a Jupyter Notebook? So there are three ways that we're fo focusing on, like uh, there are three common ways. The first one is through Google Collaboratory, which is just running on Google servers. And this allows for some, uh, as the name suggests, collaboration as well. That's Kaggle, which is similar, or you can just run it locally, which is what I'll be doing today. Right, so this is a screenshot of a, Google Collaboratory, so running Jupyter Notebook there. So you can see over here, uh, this is a basically a cell. This contains text and below here it contains code. And you can just press the play button and it will actually uh, compute this code. So in this case, it computes seconds in a day to be this value. Yeah. Right, so Jupyter is actually quite cool because not only you can use it for data analysis, you can actually use it to do teaching as well. So here are some of the pros that Jupyter has over like conventional methods. So firstly, there's no setup modes. So students don't have to install Python and all that. You can just run all code inside the notebook. So yeah, this is uh, this helps you get around a very common issue. Oh no, Python 2 versus Python 3, student doesn't know, right? 
And second, if using Google Colab, you can just log in to the student's notebook to check progress during the lesson. So let's say the student has some bugs. You can just log in in there and say, okay, I'll help you. Uh, this is your error and this is how you fix it. Or you can even fix it for show them how to fix it. And third, instructions are much easier to follow because they're right above the code. So if you look here, there are instructions and then code here. So no longer you have the alt tab between documents to uh, see what you have to do. All right. So the problem with all of this is uh, COVID-19. And uh, yeah, why is it COVID-19? Is because e-learning is kind of bad. All right. So firstly, the, I'm going to propose a couple of questions. First, suppose you are the, a teacher. Let's say you're teaching students code over Zoom. How would you help students debug? Let's propose some like uh, possible scenarios. Student asks you, oh, help, why my code bug? And they didn't include the code, so you don't know what's going on. Or another student comes out, comes out in, uh, like maybe in Zoom chat and says, why my code bug? And they screenshot the code, but it's a so pixelated, resolution so low that you cannot read it. Or maybe the same student comes back to you after five times because it's impossible to explain how you fix code over Zoom. Or maybe they have an infinite loop and then you cannot, you cannot really debug it over Zoom. It's, it's not plausible. Or yeah, they just paste the entire code into Zoom chat. And, or in, even, even worse, you cannot, uh, I cannot copy because like, let's say I'm running using a different meeting host and I cannot copy code. And finally, where's the screen share button? That's a common thing, all right, yeah. So you can see uh, generally not very good. Second problem, let's say you are again, the teacher running the class, how would you track student progress remotely? So uh, here is something that you as a student or like if you've done TAing before, you might, have, you might have this experience before. You ask, does everyone understand so far? Nobody says anything. Have you gotten until here? Nobody says anything. And then if you go like, let's say you're a bit desperate and you really want to see students' reactions, Please on cam so I can see whether you understand and then maybe one student who wants participation does it and the rest all just like blank or black uh, screens. And then you say, okay, fine. Uh, I, pre I presume that everyone understands. We'll move on to the next part and then suddenly you see this. Yeah, so this is not ideal. So the solution is Prinoculus. What does it do? Let's, uh, let's do a bit of a description. So when you have a Jupyter notebook, let's say you have a worksheet, it will hook into the execution process of this notebook and send the data to a remote server. At the start of the execution, the student will be prompted to enter a username. And then later after that, when a student runs any cell, any code, the teacher can view uh, the following information on the dashboard. They can see the code, username, code written, and like even statuses, outputs, errors. So yeah, this diagram is like what we had on our uh, dev post, which is summarizes what, what Pinoculus does. So as you can see here, pinoculus.py is actually like an extension to Jupyter. Uh, and to be more precise, an extension to IPython, which I'll describe more later. So let's give a bit of a demo about uh, for this first. Right, so you can see this, right? I have three tabs. So over here, this is what the instructor will be able to view. So this is the dashboard. So currently there's nothing because uh, no students are connected yet. And let's say this is the student uh, they, are, they have a worksheet over here, and then uh, I've done something a bit special here. Like usually, uh, you're supposed to get the script from a remote source, but uh, this demo will be local, so we'll be just loading it from uh, from this file. Okay. So the first thing the student will do is actually just run this cell and just type in username Friday X. Right. And then after this, you can actually see the teacher will be able to see like, oh, okay, the student ran, the student loaded the extension. And it's from the student name, Friday X. Then next, let's say the student uh, does some code like add A, B, they wrote return A plus B. And then, yeah, over here. Uh, okay, run it. It returns the correct answers. And the teacher can actually see everything here, like the output lines and uh, the code that was written. So formatted quite nicely. All right, so let's uh, give a bit more examples. Let's say you want to remove exclamation points from a string and uh, sure, let's do that. And the teacher can see, okay, student did it, no problem. And okay, you can even do something with graphs. Like, okay, let's, uh, let's plot a small graph. It's a smiley face, yes. And the teacher can actually see the image itself. So that's actually something that works. Finally, let's say the student has some bug. They did something here, like they implemented divide A, B. But then they accidentally ran it on like something divide zero. Oh no. 
run or oh, no error. And then they complain to the teacher. It's like, oh, my bug, my code got error. I don't know why. But the teacher can actually see. Like there's a there's a stack trace over here, right? So it's quite convenient to debug using this uh using binoculars. Right. So you can see through this uh demo that we actually can solve some of the problems that we just raised. And so yeah. So next I'll be going into how binoculars works. So to understand that, we have to first understand how Jupyter works. So Jupyter works using IPython. So Jupyter runs on IPython. And IPython is like a Python shell with extra powers known as magics. So examples, what you can do in IPython, you can type object question mark and you will display documentation. Like what is object? You can type an exclamation mark and then a command like ls and then it will run the command on your shell and return a result. Or you can do something like a two percent signs and time it. And then it will print the execution time for all the code in your current system. All right, so the important part about IPython, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that IPython supports extensions. So you can define new magics, or let's say you have some other um, math library that's not the standard matplotlib or pandas. You can actually work with those two. You can render images and math from that. Or you can detect and respond to events. And this is clearly what we want to do, because we want to send a copy of the data to the teacher every single time the student runs some code. So let's see which events are supported from the documentation. Let's just zoom in on here. You can see that there are five events, and one of them is post run cell, and it says it fires after user entered code returns. And the result is the object that will be returned as an execution result. Not very helpful. Let's, let's see what it does. So I implemented something very simple here. So this is the entry point for any IPython extension, and I registered the event post run cell to invoke the print result function. So I just print the object that's passed to the function. All right, let's try it out. So first, first line just loads the extension. The second line prints one plus two. And you can see it prints three here, of course, of course it should. But the execution result object, which is passed to our function, result equals none. Where did three go? So yeah, clearly something went wrong. And the thing is that the execution result in the event callback actually isn't very helpful because it only returns result from the last line of code. And because print over here doesn't actually have a return value, so it returns none. So it means that there's no printer output, no SCD out, no error stack traces or STD error. And it doesn't even work with matplotlib or pandas or some data analysis libraries because IPython only works with those because of special functionality coded into IPython. How do we capture all this output to forward to the instructor? All right, so what we did was some uh, code searching and you know, source code diving because we really needed to understand how IPython worked at a deeper level. We also abused the Python context manager a bit and a bit of monkey patching as well. So it's, it's generic hacking stuff. All right. <clears throat> so where does all this inspiration come from? So we, when we did, dug through the IPython magics, one of the magics is actually quite interesting. It's the percent percent capture cell magic. It's able to intercept STD out and STD error of a cell and then you'll return it as a very nice object. So IPython can do this, why can't we, right? So we will see how they did it by using GitHub search. And searching here, and then we see, okay, test for ipythons.util.capture. That's interesting, and let's go there, and then, oh, capture output, it's a class. Right, so yeah, we, find, we found a file. And so from this file, we can actually learn quite a few things. So I'll summarize it. IPython actually displays stuff uh, like this. So whenever you have some object that's supposed to be printed to the user, let's say the graph, uh, first, thing, first thing first, it's not actually like a graph yet. It's not an image yet. So from a Python object, IPython first calls a display formatter. This will convert the object to a rich representation. So in this case, a Seaborn facet grid is like a data cell data points will be converted to a PNG image. After that, uh, IPython will call the display publisher, which will invoke the IPython front end. So it's not necessarily Jupyter, but in this case, it's, our, it's the display on our Jupyter web app. Okay, so how does capture output work? So IPython conveniently provides certain hooks, and these hooks allows us to write uh, overwrite certain parts of like the execution. So like this, this process. And one of these hooks is known as display hook, and it manages everything that has to do with writing to display. Capture Output implements a custom display hook. It's called Capturing Display Hook to intercept these objects. So over here, it hooks into this process. And instead of uh, printing to the front end, 
it intercepts the objects and prints them as a returns them as a captured I/O. All right. So yeah, that's our answer. So we can actually just run capture output, and then afterwards we will have our all the STD out and stuff, right? Not quite. How do we use capture output? It's not a function, right? It's a class. So and if you try and just create the class, it doesn't do anything. The reason why it doesn't do anything is because capture output is uh, actually a Python connect context manager. You are supposed to be run with the with keyword. So for example, with uh, capture output as, as cap. So over here. So yeah, this is this describes what a context manager does. So the main IPython process runs, and when it runs, it sees this line with capture output as cap. It will first run the capture magic setup code, so some setup, and then it will run the stuff with, within the block. After it's done, it will run the teardown code. So we want to do something like this. We want to somehow get it to set up and tear down. And in this, in our case, we want to set it up in pre-run cell. Before the user runs the cell, we want to start capturing. After the user runs the cell, we want to stop capturing. That's ideal. The problem is if we do something like this with capture output as cap, we cannot really put the user cell code, which in here, because the user cell code is the stuff that the user runs, it's not our extension. So the user code is outside our extension code, extension scope, so we cannot do that. So the solution is to make a context manager, right? So we manually invoke the context manager functions. Before running a cell, we call enter, which is how Python uh, runs the setup, this part. And then after, after we are done, post run cell, we'll run exit, which is how the Python tears down. So this is a fake context manager, which does not care about objects, uh, about user code scope. Right, we're not done yet because, yeah, we've, done, we've gotten capture output to work, but it doesn't print the full error stack trace. So this is because uh, IPython works a bit differently with STD error. And the, the solution is actually to look at this certain function, interactive shell, which is the shell that you saw earlier, underscore show trace back. So this function is in, invoked whenever IPython wants to display some error trace back to the GUI. Our solution is to intercept this, to, to overwrite this function, monkey patch it, which is, in other words, we are overwriting the function during execution. So our new function will intercept a copy of the error trace back before we actually invoke the original function. So this is, if you remember, basically a hook, right? Because we are kind of altering how it works. Right, so over here, you see the code, and I'll go through it line by line. It's actually quite simple. So first line, or uh, save the original show trace back in some other variable. And then I'll define the function, which will replace the show trace back. And afterwards I'll set show trace back to the new function, hook show trace back. Okay, so what does the hook do? So the first two lines actually obtains the stack trace and save it inside our watcher class. The watcher is, the, is basically where all the extension magic takes place. So yeah. And then afterwards it invokes the original function. So through this, we have somehow intercepted a copy of the error. So yeah, that's how it's done. Okay, so we are done with the IPython part. And honestly, there's not much discover, uh, there's not much to discuss about the web server part because this is basically a well, it's a proof of concept, so it's kind of bare bones. But yeah, there are some web server improvements that we can do. For example, we can aggregate student data. So let's say a student Friday hack sends in a lot of runs a lot of code. We want to see all the the, all the cells this student runs in one place that could be done. We could uh, think of something like creating or deploying sessions, like a teacher wants to create a worksheet and send them to students and manage the session, that could be done as well. There could be downloadable records through CSV or other formats, so the teacher can basically review the session afterwards. Or alternatively, through the dashboard directly, the teacher can access the student's collab to help them debug. Right, and uh, for extension, it's actually not, well, it's not that uh, fleshed out yet because there are some features that we want to include. So for example, we want to be able to detect which cell is being executed. So let's say the teacher sends a worksheet and one of the cells is where the student is supposed to type code. We want to detect what cell it is without using the code inside because the student can just alter the code however they wish. So this will be useful for things like automated grading where the teacher wants to like say, uh, check what the answer, answer the student code prints or something like that. And right now it's not very easy to do, but in a more updated version of Jupyter Notebook, cell IDs will be a thing and they will be fixed. This will allow uh, our worksheet to have basically 
uh, know that which cell is being run and which cell is, and send the ID of the cell to the server. Right, so yeah, some takeaways from this project. Yeah, understand your tools because uh, it's very important to know what your tools are capable of. And open source is cool. As you can see, we use some code search and open source to really figure out what is going on with IPython, which might seem like a pretty opaque library at first. And it's not a dirty hack if it works. And yeah, if uh, other people do it, yeah, it's less, less so. And yeah, uh, last one, half Python, half, half Python go. I can't really do it. Brr. Okay. We are done. So any questions? Any questions from the floor? Um, Eugene here. I sympathize with every one of the problem examples and I felt very personally attacked because I encountered all of it even in person lessons when I conducted code lessons in the past. So forget about the Zoom part, it still happens. <laughs> <laughs> it yes, but uh, the difference is that in person, you can actually just look over their shoulder and maybe even type on their keyboard to help them. In Zoom, it's not possible. Yeah, so I, I can imagine it being amplified a thousand times. Um, seeing that Jupyter Notebook, there's a, what, uh, there's an iJavaScript, um, and uh, this is something that I really wish I could have done in the past because I when I did more, more of like JavaScript stuff. Um, any plans to integrate with that? And... Uh, more like any plans to further this project, it be as an open source project or even as a commercial project or both. Any plans on either? Also, your dirty hack and that dirty. It seems very clean. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit the, the extension code is actually quite short, but the, it involves quite a few tricks here and there. All right, so any plans to integrate with uh, JavaScript or further the project? Uh, currently, no. Uh, because this idea was mainly from another teammate, uh, Siyuan. And uh, he actually created it. Like, he wanted to make this project before conducting a course of his. Like he wanted to, he was conducting a code course. Like, he wanted to create it beforehand, but he couldn't make it in time. So we did it for hack and roll instead. Yeah, so in the future plans, I'm not sure. It might depend on him. Yeah, I haven't personally heard or tried using iJavaScript before, but it sounds like a thing. And considering how widespread JavaScript is used nowadays, it, it might be more yield to actually try something out like that. So interest, interesting topic, we might look into it. Uh, in terms of maintenance and all that, um, I have been approached by some uh, juniors and other people who are actually interested in making their own forks of it so far. So uh, maybe they'll see what they, can, they have to offer. Um, but yeah, I mean, our code is always, it, it's, everything is still open source. If you think, if you think that you want to make it into a commercial product, please go ahead. Everything is there for you to see and copy yourself. Lah. No, yeah, not me, but I'm just asking if you're all planning to use this. Anything free to ask me. <laughs> I can I can advise on either options. <laughs> Alright, are there any other questions? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, I mean some parts of the uh, implementation details earlier, but I was wondering, is it possible to uh, suspend the execution of the cell and then modify it from the instructor side? So for example, they are typing one plus two, you modify it to be one plus three or something like that. Hmm. Not sure about that really, uh, do not know. As, as far as I know, there's no API to like pre-edit cells before it's run. I mean, I guess you could, uh, <laughs> you know, something we'll have to look into. But I mean, it's already very suspicious if you have, if you have our little extension here, which links all the incoming data. Once you have, once you have instructor code going into a student's machine, that comes even more sus. You essentially get remote code execution, which I'm not sure how I'm not sure how much Google will appreciate of teachers doing that on other their servers, lah. This is something to think about. I agree. <laughs> understand thank you very much yeah this kind of goes against uh, some of security therefore the joke i spy mb any more questions uh hi i just want to ask right because just now the demo is in the local jupyter notebook right does it work with kaggle and like google collab 
Can you just load the extension and intercept the data also? Yeah, actually, if you go to the, uh, like the extension originally is not, uh, like I, you see a comment or a line here. So when we actually did the, uh, did the presentation for the live judging, we actually had this in, we hosted the script on this server and you can just load this code online. And in fact, uh, it's a bit different for Google code that we had to like upgrade your IPython in order to do it first, but it, it really just works. If you want to see, a, sorry, okay, I'm, I apologize for the MRT sounds. Um, if you don't want to see a live demo of it working on Kaggle, uh, I believe the Hack and Roll live stream that happened, uh, the, day two, the day two of Hack and Roll 2020 live stream, we did a live demo of it and it was running off Kaggle. So yeah, currently we, we took down the online server because we don't want people vandalizing stuff on there. But if you do want to try and run it for yourself, by all means, you should be able to do it. And in fact, actually, you based up a very good point. One of the important considerations we had when making this project was we wanted to make sure it did work on online platforms like this. Uh, this meant that we actually can't, and we, our product here, we didn't want it to interface with Jupyter. So, um, okay, so one alternative solution that we thought about was what if we make a Jupyter plugin instead? So instead of a plugin that interacts with Python, we have a plugin that interacts with the client-side JavaScript. So when the student types in one code, it, it will like reforward the, uh, we will reforward the output data from the client side to the teacher. So we did consider doing that. However, I'm very sure Google and Kaggle and everybody else who hosts, uh, Python notebooks online, they will be very happy if you're running arbitrary ch client JavaScript on that side. So that's one way that we couldn't do it. Therefore, that's that's why our hack had to go in very di very deep into like Python internals and we make this funny approach to this problem now. So yeah, if you do want to see live working, yeah, you can check the live stream. i see if we can get a link to you later. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for your very cool talk. I, I'm sure many TAs will find this really useful. Yeah, so thank you so much. All right. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening. And yeah, I'll pass the time back to the speaker. Uh, Wait, or the MC. So thank you so much. Um, th thank you everyone for coming today, offline or online. And I hope you enjoyed you enjoyed the first two talks, one by Yuji and the other by various hack and roll team of 2022. So also we want to talk about recruitment. So NS hackers were excited about spreading hacker culture through hackathons, hacker school, and events like today. So if you're passionate about working for this mission, then you can indicate your interest on our page here, and we hope to see you around. And also, we would like to thank our thank our sponsor JetBrains for sponsoring us and make for making this Friday hacks possible. And lastly, um, please do fill in the feedback form via the QR code here, and also subscribe to our Telegram channel. Thank you, and see you next week.